You're listening to a Hebrew and Israel podcast with Yoel HaLevi, exploring the language, culture, and history of the Bible. For more information, visit us at HebrewandIsrael.net. Shalom, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Hebrew and Israel Haftarah series. I'm your host, Yoel HaLevi. I want to thank you for joining me again, and I hope you enjoyed the previous episodes. This Haftarah, this uh, reading this for our week, is the Haftarah Mishpatim, and we're going to be reading from Yirmiyahu, or Jeremiah 34, verse 8. Everyone starts from the same place. Uh, most traditions go all the way to 34, 22, and then add 33, 25 to 26. The Yemenites actually don't do that. What Yemenites do is they read from 34, 8 all the way to 35, 19. Uh, we are going to to the majority practice in this one, and uh, we're going to focus specifically on this reading because th- this is one specific unit that has a lot of very interesting details in it. I first of all want to remind everyone that these episodes are produced for free, and you are more than welcome to share with your friends and family. I sometimes get emails asking if it's okay to share, and the answer is most definitely yes. And obviously, like always, comments are more than welcome. Um, if you see something that might be incorrect, like always, I'm more than o- more than open to hear corrections because our point is to reach to the to the core of things to understand understand things correctly. Like always, everything here is produced for free. I have to take time to produce these things, record, study, and so on. So, if what I've done here has blessed you, please consider helping out with the effort. Now, our reading specifically focuses on two laws. There are two laws which we can talk about, and one major subject, which is the subject of covenant. This is a very big, very major subject. I've personally studied this during my bachelor's. I'm studying it right now during my master's. Um, Covenants, um, there are many, 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 many documents that deal with covenants. I am specifically right now doing a research on comparative covenant documentation, uh, what I'm doing is a very, very common subject. A lot of people study. I'm currently studying it uh, with the tutoring of one of my professors at the university as a, a research that I'm developing. And there are some really, really fascinating things out there. And so what I want to first of all do, like the format that I always do, is I first want to do an introduction, and then I will go into the actual verses themselves. Now, covenants are... A concept that existed this very day, but we don't really call them covenants anymore. We call them diplomacy. We call them uh, diplomatic uh, dialogue. We call them agreements and stuff like that. We don't really use the term covenant anymore. We actually use just other terminology that comes later on because the world has moved into a secular principle. But behind every agreement, no matter what the agreement is, there is the understanding that there is a commitment between parties. And the commitment between parties is one of the core elements of covenant. In an S, in a way, all human beings are in covenant with one another. Or at least you are in some kind of covenant with the people that surround you. Because a covenant basically means that you have agreed, either out of will or out of necessity or whatever it might be. There's a whole philosophical debate that exists, uh, for example, in the Age of Enlightenment about this subject. Why do people agree to live with one another? Why do, why do people do what they do? And in truth, the exact answer is probably depending on the specific situation you're dealing with. However, what's very, very important to understand is that covenants are, are the most basic thing that make existence possible. Because if we don't agree to live with one another, then there's complete chaos. And chaos is the exact opposite of what reality, what reality, at least for us as living creatures, is is something that if we don't have if we don't have order, if we only exist in chaos, then everything it, life cannot really exist. Um, a very interesting thing that I remember reading uh, or sorry hearing about years ago was the fact that for life to exist, there has to be a very very precise sequence of things that that have to happen, a very precise existence of things. That have to happen for for life to exist. So we see that the principle of order is for for existence, for life is embedded in the principle of order. 
So the Hebrew word for covenant is brit. And brit, there's a lot of questions about the etymology specifically, uh, the connection to the idea of cutting. Karat brit, is it, to cut a covenant, is a very, very common term. Uh, in, in the ancient Near East, what people sometimes will do is actually cut up an animal, slaughter an animal. So there's some symbology behind cutting up the animals. And so a lot of people try to find the word Brit with something to do with cutting and so on. However, other etymologies that I've read about the subject actually deal more with the idea of tying, binding things to one another. And that's probably the more accurate uh, function. And unfortunately, the, the the idea of cutting a covenant is probably what led a lot of people to think the idea is to cut something, but it's probably not the fact. Now, covenants, we have covenants that go way, 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 way back. We have covenants that go out back thousands of years. And some of the uh, most important documentation that we have from the ancient world are actually documents. Now, the, uh, sorry, covenant documents. Now, there are, there's a lot of questions in regards to how it all started and, and, and what are the earliest ones that we have and so on. And there have been multiple uh, publications that deal with this principle of covenants. Uh, specifically, for example, I'm working on uh, Kev, Dr. Kevin Kitchen's book is a massive, massive book, uh, also very expensive. I was terrified when I checked it out of the library at the university because it's a very, very expensive book, but he covers over a hundred documents from the ancient Near East and he translates them. They're written in multiple languages, some of them languages that you have to be a real expert to understand. Um, one of those languages I actually do know how to read, um, but there are also documentations there in Egyptian, and Chittite and, Sh and Sumerian or Sh Shumerit that we don't specifically um, it, to, to read Chittite and, Sh and, and Sumerian you have to be a real big expert and I have a professor who's actually studied these languages and S Sumerian is a very very difficult language, language to study uh, but there are people who are experts uh, it really is categorized its own ca as its own language it doesn't belong to any language uh, family languages I specifically have, have been studying Akkadian, so I can read some of the Akkadian and understand a lot of the constructions there. But one of the most important things to understand is it doesn't really matter what the language is. What's very interesting is that there's a certain consistency in some principles when you look through these documents. And the idea of a covenant being something that old that continues into our very day where we have party one, party B, and so on, and the stipulations, and then the threats, and the principles are still the same, which is a really, really interesting thing. So when you, for example, have a constitution of a state, or if you have a company's policy, and you sign with a company, or, or you are a company, and you're doing an agreement with another company, and you have your lawyers sit down, it's still the same thing. You're not doing, you're not really doing certain the exact same ceremonies, but you're still doing the same act. So covenants at this very day exist. Now, covenants themselves usually contained, uh, or it depends what period you're in. Some covenants just go straight to the point. Some covenants have a prologue. It's a very common thing with the Chittite documentation, which is part of what I'm researching right now. And the... Um, and then you have your stipulations, which are usually types of laws. And then you have uh, sometimes blessings and curses. Uh, curses are very, very common. Usually curses are the more common ones that you find. Threats of to, towards one another if someone breaks the agreement. Or um, uh, blessings if you um, there will be an exchange of, of blessings to one another. Different possibilities. And what you end up with is an agreement. And then you have people signing the agreements, people receiving copies of the agreements, agreements being updated every several generations. Uh, for example, uh, one of the more interesting things that I've been looking at um, is a research by uh, Dr. Levinson, the his first name right now. He's been talking, I, I read articles by him about uh, the, the Chittite prologue and the, the updating, because we can see the, the same document presented several times after several generations, and we can see more of the same document about how they sometimes change certain details or what's the purpose of changing those details and so on. 
But the overall idea is really when you look over thousands of years of human history, covenants have been very, very important. Now, historically speaking, covenants were also based on the idea that there are gods in, in other cultures or in Israel that there is a god, and that you are obligated to keep your, um, your covenant based on the fact that if you don't, the god will punish you. Now, today, God is not mentioned in most documents, but there is an enforcement of law in certain circumstances if someone breaks the law. You can actually force things. Now, if we think about international law today, for example, uh, one of our major problems that we have is that international law is a, is a really interesting idea, but it's completely hypothetical. Because for international law to have any effect, all parties have to agree that that law is law. But international law is basically several countries that have power enforcing themselves on other countries saying, you have to follow these laws. But if another country is strong enough, then that country can say, I snub your laws, I don't care. Now, that's actually very similar to the principle of a vassal treaty. So there were several types of treaties. There were patriot treaties, which means that both sides are equal. So, for example, if you have the United States versus China, it's a big topic right now, and um, two powers are equals, then the understanding is of a certain equality. And therefore, the sides agree upon certain stipulations of law, of what the agreements are. And if one side breaks it, the other side has a right to respond to that. Now, what do you do if, for example, you have US, EU, and China have agreements, and then you have smaller countries which are not connected to these agreements, South Afri African countries, South American countries, Israel, what have you, India, oh, India actually is not a small country, but still, what happens if these countries have agreements with them? Or what happens, for example, if the EU makes a decision and uh, say, for example, there was a very specific case that the EU has been threatening to boycott things from, from, from Judea and Samaria, and the US actually has inside its, its, inside the regulations of the trading agreement with the EU that they can't boycott someone who is an ally of the United States, and so on. There are a lot of like these little twists and turns. But the problem is that this is an agreement between equals, so they can go head to head. However, anyone underneath those levels of power have a problem. They're basically vassals. So really today, what was considered to be kingship in the past today is just basically economics. Today, everything is based on economics. Whoever has the eco economical power is the one that has the say on everything. So right now, for example, China and Russia are building up against the EU and the US, um, and that can lead to a war. There's also an issue here of who's taking sides with what, because, for example, Israel is not really a vassal c c country of anyone, but Israel is in a friendly agreement with the United States. So the United States has a certain uh, obligation towards states like Israel. It's not just Israel, by the way. It's other countries as well. Egypt is also, by the way, inside the picture as well. While Syria, for example, has become, I would say, more like a vassal state of Russia. China, for example, has a whole issue with, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Taiwan. Taiwan. Taiwan is under the protection of the United States, but China wants to expand and take over Taiwan. So now there's a whole issue here. I was actually reading the news the other day, and there's this whole threat that China might go to war against the, against, against the United States because of Taiwan. So in essence, what we're looking at, and if you study, for example, World War I, World War II, any of these things, these are all connected to principles of covenant, in, and it's identical. It is, it is identical in a scary way, because what it does is it binds different countries to one another to uh, support the side they're on, which is the reason why, for example, we had World War, World War I and World War II. There were agreements between different countries, and these countries went to war against one another because of the agreements they had with other countries. My father, for example, studied the Second World War, and specifically the Holocaust. Remember, when I was a teenager, I asked my dad, so how do these wars begin? How do these wars begin? And the very simple answer is because of these different agreements between these different groups. Now, 
what do you do if you have states that don't care? Like, for example, Iran doesn't care what other countries think. How does international law affect them? The answer is it doesn't, because Iran, for example, is a state that doesn't care about any other covenant on the face of the earth. They don't care about anyone else except for themselves. The government itself is super corrupt and really, no one really knows what the, the average Iranian actually thinks. Uh, same issue, by the way, with, with North Korea. North Korea does what North Korea does, but when you actually speak with the citizens, you don't really know. We, when we hear stuff from them, we know that this is not really what the people want. And uh, these are countries that do whatever they want. People try to label Israel the same way. No, no chance. It's not the same thing at all. But you have a problem with what you do with states or places like that that don't care about international law, don't care about these agreements and covenants because they want to do whatever they want to do. Now, in the ancient world, for example, you could go in and conquer such a place, but people today prefer diplomacy over other things. However, the problem is that where your loyalties lie, that's where you will decide that an agreement is effective or not. So in the ancient world, what would happen, it doesn't matter what kind of treaty it was, because there's multiple types. There's Pretrit Treaty, which is... Um, which is between equals, there's vassal treaties, which is larger kingdom controls smaller kingdom. There are um, gift treaties, different types of gift treaties where a king gives a, a loyal subject property and stuff like that. And what they would do is they would put in the names of the gods. Now in a polytheistic world where you weren't too bothered if there are other gods, actually most people believe that there's a god, there's a god in every single place, but they believe that their god is the most supreme god. And when their god was conquered, they believe that, that people believe that that god was defeated in some way or another. Uh, we actually see echoes of these ideas, by the way, in the book of Daniel. There's a very unusual segment there about um, angels battling one another, taking that principle and moving into a more angelic realm instead of gods fighting one another. But we still see that idea there in Daniel. And what we end up with is that you allowed your God to stand in the place of the witness, and basically if you broke the agreement, you were under threat. However, Iran, for example, is a country, it's a, is a Muslim country, a Shiite Muslim country, and for them, their understanding of covenant is that they have a covenant with their God, that everyone else is not really part of that structure, and everyone else can be played around with because their beliefs are what really lead them. There's actually experts in Iranian uh, way of thinking, and I've actually read some of these experts. And, and, and the thing is that Iran, for example, is an apocalyptic state. It's a state that believes in the coming of a messiah. It's a very, very dangerous philosophy inside Islam um, that is the reason why, for example, there are many, many Sunni states which are very concerned about Iran. Um, so, for example, if we take this into consideration about the ancient world, in the ancient world, Israelites, for example, would be considered somewhat of a distant, distant type of group because Israelites were monotheistic. The book of Deuteronomy openly says, you will not do covenants with them and their gods. Okay? Uh, it doesn't mean that na that Israel couldn't be friendly with other nations, but you had to be very, very careful what you agree upon and so on. This is why uh, it's very interesting that we rarely see Israelite kings um, mentioned in different agreements or covenants in the ancient world, and most of them didn't really have to. We don't, I, don't, I don't think we actually have any documentation of, we have documentation of Israelite, of Judean kings, for example, or Israelite kings in different documentation from the ancient Near East, but we never really hear them uh, about, about them taking a vow in front of someone. And that might actually be an indicator, and again, it's mostly speculation, it might be an indicator that the Israelite kings swore, um, in God's name, in the, God, in the name of the God of Israel. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Jeremiah actually mentions this, that they vowed uh, I can't remember if it's Jeremiah or Ezekiel, they, they vowed in my name, and, and now they're breaking this agreement, that they vowed to the king of Babylon that they won't rebel, and they probably vowed in God's name and not 
and didn't really actually mention any other gods and so on. Because in truth, you were expected to be a man of your word. You'd be expected to be a person of your word. And you, you, you threatened yourself by mentioning that your God is a witness to this agreement. So in the eyes, for example, of the Iranian government, any agreement that disrespects their culture and their religion and their God cannot be a truthful agreement. What I'm talking here might be a little hot. Maybe someone will get really upset with me for saying these things. I'm not sure any of my listeners, but maybe someone that might be outside of the listeners. But to understand some of these principles, you have to try to put into our world today. And because there are still countries which have, um, specifically, I, I'm just saying, Iran is, is a very, very, very good example of a religious state. We don't really have too many religious states anymore. So, and, and this is a religious state that has a very, very specific way of looking at things in the world. And in the ancient world, people looked in that way. So Iran is, is somewhat an, a, a, a frozen reality, an archaic reality in our world today of a monotheistic extremist way of thinking that plays around with diplomacy, but only does it for its own benefit. And when the, when, when the agreement is signed, in truth, the way it's perceived is through bringing honor to their own religion, to their God, as a purpose of, of honoring what they believe in. And if that agreement doesn't honor what they believe in, the agreement is void. Now, when we talk about covenants as well, it's very, very important to understand that um, at the end of the day, not everyone kept everything. This is this is this is something that that's no surprise whatsoever. People broke their covenants left, right, and center. It's another thing that's very, very important. Even if a person signed their name and said, with vowed with their God and everything, people still calculated based on what brings honor to their people, what brings honor to their God, what brings honor to their king, whatever order they work by. Each group was a little different, um, but usually it's the God and then the king and the people and so on. And when a situation becomes dishonorable towards these things, like for example, uh, you reach a point where your your commitment to this specific king brings shame to you, that will be a point where you decide to break off the covenant and say, we're not going to respect this anymore. And a very good example of this is King Hezekiah. He rebelled. Fact remains, he rebelled. There, regarding that period of time, we know that the, these all these things are factual. And he rebelled. Why? Because it brought dishonor to the God of Israel. It brought dishonor to the crown. It brought dishonor to the people. But it cost them. It cost them a lot. There was a lot of damage to, to Judea during this period. And but King Hezekiah was able to save Jerusalem, and that was that was actually a big thing. You'd be surprised the moment they didn't conquer Jerusalem. That was that was a, a, a big achievement. Same thing with um, King Josiah, for example. Um, a lot of uh, his his own father leaned upon Egypt for protection. He actually wanted to show that his father was wrong. That they brought disrespect to the God of Israel, so he broke the agreement with Egypt, and he actually went to war. He tried to go to war against the Egyptians. Unfortunately, he was killed. And this is actually relates to the time of, King Je of, of the prophet Jeremiah as well. So, even inside covenants and agreements, you still had to calculate a lot of things that had to do with who you are, and and sometimes the principle of doing what's more honorable uh, towards a person is what counts, and sometimes doing something that's more honorable towards your God is what, what counts. For example, we have a case that um, the king of Aram Damesek goes to Samaria. He, he speaks with King Ahaziahu, who was the son of, um, I think it was Ahav, or he, he was the grandson of Ahav, I think, something like that. And he 
um, basically is um, is told by by um, by King. I think it was probably Hadad at this point, but it might have been might have been someone else. Uh, but the king of Aram Damascus basically tells him, "You have to surrender to me." He says, "Okay, fine, no problem." And then he says to him, uh, "And everything that you have, I'm going to take, and so on." And the king says, "I can't do this. This is ridiculous. I can't do these things." And there's actually a midrash that explains that what was really going on there is that he needed. Uh, he was told to pay t- tribute. He was fine with that. But the moment he, the, the midrash says, the moment he was told that he needs to forfeit something do, to do with the God of Israel, that's where he said, I'm not willing to do it. Um, so, I actually had a discussion with one of my professors about this, and he said that it was very, very common that sometimes agreements were not respected uh, because of different things that people took into consideration. Now, on the other hand, the covenant of the Torah is a covenant between Israel and God. This, as far as I know, there is nothing similar to it in the ancient world. And the Torah is the only document that actually talks about the idea of a covenant between a people and their God. The God was usually something that was related to you as a group, and you were, you know, people knew that you have to give service to that God. But in the Torah, it's presented as a covenant, which is a very, very different um, way of looking at religion in the ancient world, which has raised a lot of questions with a lot of scholars over... This is basically the thing I'm researching right now, so now's not really a good time to really go into this, uh, but this is a very famous subject. A lot has been studied about this, specifically studies in the book of Deuteronomy, um, but the Torah itself is seen as a covenant between a people and their God, and this is something that continuously goes on because one side of the covenant never vanishes, never goes away. And the other side of the covenant is renewed all the time in the next generation. This is where we actually find the idea of every seven years reading the Torah. This is why we have every 50 years as a jubilee. Um, th- these things are basically renewals of covenant. You can even say that Shavuot is an annual renewal of covenant. And then the, and then the, and the Shemitah, the sabbatical year, is a renewal of covenant. And then the 50th year is a renewal of covenant because 50 years is about the time of a generation. Well, it depends how you calculate, but 50 years is probably most of the original generation of the previous 50 years are not around. And therefore, you have to renew this all the time. And covenants were probably being done and promises were probably being made all the time. And people made agreements with God, and they, st- and they stood before God and did a ceremony and so on. There's a chance that a lot of kings did this beyond what we actually know. But we do have several descriptions of kings that renewed the temple. And that's uh, we can link that to a lot of practices that were done by other kings. This is how they renewed sometimes their agreement with a god by reestablishing their temple um, and things like that. Now, after this very lengthy introduction with a lot of politically charged discussions, we go now into two other laws that exist here. And I mentioned the Jubilee. This is one of the laws that we have to talk about here, the Jubilee and the sabbatical year. You release your servants on after seven years of, of, of servitude. And then you also have, every, on the 50th year, you release your servants no matter what. Now, the... What's very interesting is that King Zedekiah was trying to do some kind of a covenantal renewal in Israel. We only get a glimpse of what was actually going on here, but there's a very, very good chance that what we're looking at is a much broader covenantal renewal than just this issue of releasing the servants. And the releasing the servants is just symbolic of the situation we're talking about being in servitude and afterwards in Babylon and the the lack of confidence in the promises made, basically demonstrating that Zedekiah Tzidkiah and his his kingship are not trustworthy, and that there's a lot of difficulties with this kingship, and therefore it's a kingship that should be discarded. So what happens here is probably what they did. It's probably very similar to what happened during the times of King Yoash, and Yoshiao, uh, Joash, and Josiah, and Hezekiah, and probably King Asa as well, is they did covenantal renewals um, by renovating the temple, by doing ceremonies in the temple, showing their loyalty to the God of Israel. And then um, they might have done some other practices. Now here, what's very interesting is that we actually get several glimpses 
into covenantal practices of the period, which are uh, very similar to what we find in the ancient world. So now we actually can go into our text. Now point these things out. And we're going to start again, as I said, from chapter 34, uh, verse 8. And it says, The word of the law, which was, the word, I have to change the order of words in, in English, the word which was to Jeremiah from the Lord, after, after King Zedekiah cut a covenant, Et kol ha'am asher b'Yerushalayim. Et here is actually trying to say is with. So the et here, the people always argue about the word uh, et, if it's translatable or not. In some, some situations it is, because at the end of the day, everyone's very misled about what the word et actually means. Everyone says it's just a direct object marker, but it's actually a preposition. The actual definition is prepositional, and uh, here it's translated as the word with. So he cut the covenant with all the people which are in Jerusalem, to call to them freedom. Derol is actually related to the term dararum, which is a term we find in uh, different Akkadian documents that have to do with freedom. It was actually one of the things a king would do. A king would call a dararum in the land when he becomes king. It's one of the ways of him establishing the principle of righteousness and justice. And kings basically had to show their righteousness. Now, a lot of these acts, by the way, were probably done out of, you know, trying to show themselves as righteous. Not that they were really righteous. There's a whole discussion, for example, about the Koro Hammurabi. Was it really practiced or was it just something that he put up to show the gods that he was, that he was a righteous king? But it, this was one of the things that was ex expected of them. Now, uh, we don't really have a date of when this happened. But this has to be something that they did they did spontaneously and because they realized they have to do something to show God they're still loyal to him. So this, Tzidkiyahu is a very tormented character because he goes back and forth all the time over um, what is actually expected of him and, and, and what he wants to do and so on. And the end, he ends up being severely punished. Okay, so I have to, I stopped there to listen for a second. And, and the noise you're hearing in the background, okay, is actually an argument over what's legally allowed and not legally allowed. Now, it's very interesting that I'm doing this recording, and that specific argument is going on in the background. Now, I don't know what the argument is, but this is fascinating because it fits directly into what we're dealing with. Uh... Unfortunately, people argue over what's allowed and forbidden. And um, the understanding here is that someone's probably broken the law in some way or another. And the neighbors are saying, listen, there's a law. The law doesn't allow you to do this. There's a law. You have to go according to these laws and regulations. That's another form of covenant. So it's, I, I have to admit, I, I hate the fact that there's noise in the background. But on the other hand, Okay, that's what we call legally a riv. This is really interesting. This is this is this is almost hilarity for me to some degree. It's not hilarity that people are fighting, but it's very interesting to to have this going on in the background because what it actually demonstrates is the principle of the riv, that the riv means a fight and an argument, and people used to have actual fights, and then the riv turns it later on into a legal argument in front of a court in front of a judge. But this is the basis of the Riv. This is the basis of what we've read before about God has a, has a Riv with Israel. That's it. The, the loud argument between people. Okay, so now we're going to continue the recording from this point onwards. The argument in the background has ended. And I had to stop just to make sure that we don't have too much noise. But this argument went on for quite a while. I was actually listening, listening, listening in. Some words are very difficult to pronounce sometimes. Uh, because um, I was trying to see what exactly was going on. It was, it was actually sounds as if it was about to ex escalate into violence. So I wasn't too sure what to do. I was actually getting ready to pull out my phone and call the police. But nothing happened yet. Okay, so what I'm going to do from this point is I'm going to start from the beginning. And um, this is uh, what we're going to do. So again, from verse 8. 
הדבר אשר היה אל ירמיהו מאת אדוני, the word, of, the word which was to Jeremiah from the Lord, אחרי קרות המלך צדקיהו ברית, after King Zedekiah cut a covenant, את כל העם אשר בירושלים, with all the people which were in Jerusalem, את translates here as with, even though uh, usually את is very difficult to translate into English, לקרוא להם דרור, to call to them דרור, דרור, freedom, דררום, it's a term that we actually find, דררום, which we find in, in uh, the ancient Near East, it's something kings were expected to do. If you were a king and you rose to your throne, you actually had to do certain acts that show your righteousness. The tzedek mishpatu mesharim, the ancient misharum, this is something kings were always, always expected to do when they came to the throne, because what it meant was that they could demonstrate and show their righteousness to everyone, and that they are actually kings who are trustworthy, that their the kingship is not just found in the fact that the God chose them, but they actually are following the laws that the gods present. And usually, um, especially if you're dealing with Mesopotamian cultures, because this is something we don't hear at all in Egypt. This is something more from the northern cultures. Uh, they had gods that were specifically gods of justice. So you actually, you did certain acts to show these gods of justice that you are a righteous king. Uh, so this was something very, very central. Now, we don't have in the text any reference to when exactly this happened during the kingship of King Zedekiah, so we don't have to assume that this was di- directly in the beginning. This actually might be somewhere in the middle, even towards the end, uh, because we are not too far away. We're only a few chapters away from the destruction of Jerusalem, so this might be something that happened uh, quite later on, later on in his kingship. And it specifies in verse 9 what exactly the drog is. To send, is to send away, to release someone. For example, divorce is shiluchim, to send someone away. Uh, in divorce, there's even a discussion about uh, Tzipora. He bore, he, he, Moshe met, met up with her after he sent her away. It's possible that Moshe actually divorced Tzipora to let her live in case that maybe he suspected maybe something might happen, or what have you, or maybe that would be the end of his ability to be in a relationship with her, so he let her go. You can discuss that one until you're blue in the face, but it's very interesting he uses that term, uh, it sounds as if Moshe divorced her. So shiluchim is really releasing someone from, the, the, from a contract, releasing someone from an obligation, uh, usually from more position of strength, so you are the one releasing someone. Now, um, it says to send away each man his avdo, his male servant, ve'ishet shifchaton, each man um, his female servant, but it specifies ha'ivri ve'ivriya, chofshim. And there's a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion what this ivri and ivriya mean and so on. Could it be uh, a social status, the apiru, uh, which re- relates to people that don't really belong anywhere inside society. Could it be that this is a reference to the Israelites? Does it mean that your servant, this specific servant, is actually an Israelite that you took in some way or another? Here it's obvious that the relationship here is between Israelites because, or between the Judeans themselves because this is symbolic of the idea of letting the people of Judea feel free. And therefore, ha'ivri ve'ivriya, at least here, is understood quite clearly as someone who belongs to the tribes of Israel and is being released under the under certain rules and regulations. Now, um, the, uh, the 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 most important part here, as well, is that it's actually using the terminology of the Book of Exodus, and this is why we read it here. It's using very precisely the exact same words. That we have in Exodus 21. So it says, Levilti avod bam bihudi achiu ish. Now it becomes even more specific. So they shall not serve or have servants in, in them bihudi, la avod bam bihudi, to, 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 to make them in, serve with a Jew, with a Judean basically. Not a Jew, but a Judean. But it's interesting the term yehudi is a very, very late term. Uh, and Jeremiah is a relatively late book, but the only there are very few places which we hear the term Yehudi, and other places the book of Esther. Um, but what's very interesting here is that it specifies these are Judeans. So, um, so a Judean would not serve 
uh, under his own brother. Okay, the, 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 the syntax is a bit funny. Avod bam achiu ish. Not too sure why the word ish is even placed here. It's a little, it's a little strange, the structure. Um, but some of the commentaries say that the, the structure is really means so no person will be in the state of servitude. And that's why the word ish, this is why a little clunky syntax here, but some of the commentaries say that the, the intent here is to say, so in order that no person will be serving one another amongst the Judeans, basically. Verse 10, Vaishmiu Chola Sarim Vichola Am, all the the ministers and all the people heard Asher Baubov Ritchamu here really means to um to uh to agree and to act. So when it says Naaseva Nishma, there's always this discussion about why is it saying Naase first? I think there's a verse a verse somewhere in Exodus that says Naaseva Nishma, but we'll do and hear, but really it's do and obey, it's synonymous. It basically means to do. You, I, I hear you, and therefore I am willing to do so. So they agreed to do so. All the ministers and the people, which came into the covenant, each man to send away his male servant and his female servant to freedom. Okay? To, to, in order not to, not to have them serve them anymore. And they heard and they sent away. However, however, they returned. After that, and they returned the male servants and the female servants, which they sent away into freedom. From the root kavash, to conquer, but here means to force. They forced them to become servants again. So Jeremiah sees this, and he, first of all, this is this is a, a wrongdoing because the moment you release someone, you have to let them go. Period. You have no right to to keep holding them because the law is when you release a servant, that's it; they're back. So this is actually under the law of kidnapping. If you're kidnapping a person to force them to be your servant, this is a violation of Torah. This is not just a violation of covenant. This is another violation um, inside the Torah of kidnapping. This person's free. You can't just walk up to a person and say, okay, now you're my servant. People used to do these with armies. For example, an army would march into another nation and conquer and say, okay, now everyone's our slaves. But among, inside your own people, we're not supposed to do that. But people did that. If you had a debt collector and so on. So even if, say, under certain laws, you were allowed to uh, to take someone as a, as a slave for whatever reason it is, the moment you let them go, the moment you give them the document that says you're a free person, then that person is free. That's it. You can't you can't force them to be your slaves anymore. And and the violation here is you made a covenant. Part of the covenant was to release everyone, and now you're breaking that covenant and breaking Torah law by taking these people forcefully back into servitude. And this is actually Jeremiah uses this to demonstrate the corruption of the behavior of the people. And he says, verse twelve. So now we actually go into the actual word of God. Because in verse 8, it says, this is the word of God after they cut the covenant and so on. But really, verses 8 to 11 are just the introduction to the actual prophecy, which starts in verse 12. So now we have to reintroduce that God is speaking to Jeremiah. It says, So there's a double doubling here, um, not only of God spoke to him, but also the name of God is doubled up here. It says, and the word of the Lord was to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Ko amar Adonai Elohei Yisrael, thus says the Lord God of Israel, Anochi karati verit avotechem boyom hotzi otam meeretz mitzrayim. I have cut, Anochi, throws us back into the Ten Commandments, Anochi Adonai Elohecha, and the Lord your God. I have karati verit avotechem. I have cut, I, Anochi, have cut a covenant with your fathers. Sending us back into the description of of the of the Exodus and specifically Exodus 19, Exodus 20, and then 21, all the way to the all the way to chapter 23. On the day which I brought them out from the land of Egypt. Now this is not literally on the actual day. It really, Bayom here really means at the time that I brought them out from the land of Egypt. Mibet Avadim from the house of servitude saying, and he's 
emphasizing the house of servitude, you have to remember, you were slaves as well. You should always remember what it means to be a slave. And now you've broken that understanding. And he actually specifically quotes the laws that we have in regards to um, in the, regards to releasing servants. Uh, specifically, we have um, Deuteronomy 15.1. And he says here, Miketz Sheva Shanim Teshalehu Ishet Achiva Ivri Asher Machir Lecha. And the, at the end of seven years, you will send away, release, completely release. Um, a person, each person will release his brother, the Hebrew, which will be sold to you. Vavadecha Shesh, and he will serve you six years. Veshilachtoch of Shimi Aimach, and you will send him away to complete freedom from, I'm adding the word complete, by the way. You will send them away complete freedom from, from your, from your myths, from your household, basically. However, your fathers did not listen to me. This is a parallel. They did not tilt their ear to me. They didn't tilt their ear. They didn't, weren't paying, they weren't willing to obey my laws. So he says, I told your fathers to do so. This covenant is eternal. Because God is eternal, the Torah, therefore the Torah is eternal, therefore these laws continue into the other generations. And as I said earlier, it was not uncommon for, gen for next generations to receive the covenant as well, if, this, if it's the same kingdoms and so on. So this is not something that's outside of the world of the ancient Near East. So he says in verse 15, V'tashuvu atem hayom, you, you, Tashuvu here doesn't mean just to return, it really means you actually have rebelled. And you rebelled today. But, uh, so it, uh, shall, um, sorry, here, it's the opposite. He uses Vitashuvu again later on with the opposite meaning. So here, Vitashuvu means you returned. You repented. You repented today. You did, which is what is upright in my eyes. To call a freedom to each, for each a man to his brother. And you cut a covenant before me. Where is before me? At the house that my name is called upon. That's very interesting. He says, my name, I know that I dwell there. And it's, that's a whole world of discussion that can exist in regards to how exactly does God dwell in the temple? Does he, does he, only his name is there? Is he, there's a lot of discussion about this in the, in the, in the, in the uh, academic world. It's very interesting. Ezekiel actually sees God leaving the temple, therefore it sounds as if Ezekiel says that the that God actually dwells in the temple. So I think some somewhere around chapter from chapter eight to chapter ten, I think, in Ezekiel. If I'm wrong, I do apologize. Um but here, and, and I've seen scholars say, Oh, yeah, because because he was a Kohen, Ezekiel was a Kohen, and therefore he understood that God actually dwells there. It's a priestly thing, and so on. Maybe, maybe not, because if you remember, Jeremiah is a priest as well, and he specifically says, your name. He fits more into the description of what happens in 1 Kings 8, where Solomon openly says, The heavens and the heavens and the heavens cannot contain you. This is only for, really only for your name, this temple. Now, um, another possibility, by the way, is the reason Jeremiah says, my name is upon it, is because the ark is no longer in the temple. And therefore, now it's only God's name who dwells there. And because the ark was removed, the actual presence is no longer there anymore, which is, which is another possibility. But then he says, Vatashuvu. He uses the exact same word, but here it means to rebel. And you rebelled, Vatahalelu Echemi, and you desecrated my name. Vatashivu Ishet Avdo Ve'ishet Shifhatu, and you brought back each man his male servant and his female servant, Asher Shilachtem Chofshil Nafsham, which you have sent to their own self to, into freedom. You let them go, let them be. It's the idea of the word Le Nafsham here, to, to be to themselves. Vatichbeshu Otam, and you came and you forced them, you, as if conquered them. Le'yot Lachem La'avadim Ushfachot, to be to you male servants and female servants. Lachen ko'amar Adonai, therefore says the Lord, the Lord, atem lo shem atem elai, do not heed to my word, do not listen to me. Likro deror ish le'achiv, to call, to call freedom a man to his brother, ve'ish le'reo, and a man to his neighbor. 
He says, "Hini kore lachem deror lezaava lechol mamlach." Sorry, kore lachem deror neum Adonai. I call a freedom to you. I skipped a line accidentally. I call a freedom to you. This, the word of the Lord, el achere ve'el adver ve'el araav, to the sword and the plague and the hunger. Ve'natati etchem lezaava lechol mamlachot ha'aris. Now place you for a trembling to all the kingdoms of the earth. ונתתי את האנשים העוברים את, בר... את בריתי, and I will place those who have transgressed against my covenant, אשר לא הקימו את דברי הברית, which did not, up... did not uphold the words of the covenant. This is how severe covenants are. You need to understand, if you make a promise, if you vow in God's name, this is very, very severe. You know, I, th- I think uh, Kohelet has a verse where he says, טוב משלא תדעו משתדעו, it's better that you don't vow than then you vow, because if you vow and you don't keep, you get into trouble. And the same thing, people had to invoke God's name here, and they had to speak God's name when they did these covenants, and it was very, very dangerous. The expectancy was that if you do such a thing, God will smite you. You will be harmed. And Jeremiah warns them, he says, look, you broke the covenant, and lo and behold, Jeremiah was right. But we also have some specifics here. He says, "Asher kartu lefanei," which they cut before me. But he specifies cutting here means ha'eged asher kartu leshnayim ve'avru ben betarav the 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 um, calf which they have cut into two and they pass between its pieces. So they did a, they did a ceremony of walking between the pieces. Now this reminds us a bit of Avraham, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, Genesis 15. Uh, this strongly reminds us of practices that we have in the ancient Near East. Here they walk between the pieces. Now, walking between the pieces is to walk over the blood of the animal. It's very symbolic of, of multiple things. It's not a sacrifice, by the way. It's very important to point out this is not a sacrifice because you don't cut an animal in, in half when you do this. The idea of cutting an animal in pieces, this is what we call a blood covenant. Uh, there was a scholar many years ago called Trumbull, Clay, Clayton Trumbull, I think his name was, and he wrote books about different types of covenants, He's, and he demonstrates the subject of blood covenants, and he goes ahead and carries on into the New Testament because he was a Christian scholar, but he does demonstrate some really interesting things about um, about blood covenants, and, the, and other scholars who went into this later on do it show that the issue here of cu- cutting an animal into pieces has to do with the idea that if um, I don't keep the covenant, this will happen to me. Now, blood covenants as well used to be, for example, there was a period, that the assumption is there was a period where they actually would cut their hands and shake with blood on their hands to show the bond. Um, there's, uh, and then eventually the servants would cut their hands because it's not nice. The king keeps on cutting his hand every time he makes a covenant, his hand's going to be completely scarred. So they had the servants do it. And eventually they started slaughtering animals to, uh, to do this. And then at once, some point, salt replaced it. They realized that there's some connection between blood and salt. And sometimes salt was used to indicate covenant here. But this is old school. This is one of the older versions of the covenant where they actually would cut an animal and walk between the pieces to symbolize their commitment to the covenant. Um, for example, uh, we actually have um, we have a an 8th century, so it's 700s, but 100 years before this case, there's uh, an, an Aramean contract between Beragia, or Bargaya, king of Katach, and Mata'el, son of Atar Samach, king of Arpad. And they actually, it comes together with curses and threats. Um, and the Aramaic actually says, V'achzi yegzar agla zena ken yegzar mata'al v'egzarun raboha, or rabava. So it says, as this, as this calf was cut, uh, it was, it was cut in half, thus mata'al will be cut in half and his master will be cut in half. In a high, the whole idea is that, you know, if it's, it's, it's supposed to be like a replacement thing, that symbolically, if I do this, this happens, and so on. That's the whole idea of why they did these practices. And he points out in verse 19, Sarei Yehuda v'Sarei Yerushalayim, the ministers of Judah and the ministers of Jerusalem, Hasarisim v'Akohanim, the eunuchs and the priests. Eunuchs here, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean people who are actually eunuchs. The term Saris, um, 
some sometimes meant eunuch, sometimes it's meant someone of high stature. And I've actually written about this because I did write an article uh, several years ago about beards, and I mentioned the fact that there's actually um, a, 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 there's a, actually a category of eunuchs who are bearded, and therefore, if you're a eunuch, usually people would turn to eunuchs would turn to eunuchs when they were children, when they were very very young. So these are these are palace servants of some sort, but we also have types of which we refer to as ones with beards. So these are not necessarily people who were made into eunuchs, uh, but they actually were just was a title that carried on in parallel to the existence of actual eunuchs. And all the people of the land, that actually might be, um, excuse me, and all the people of the land, these are probably not just people of the land, these are probably we- the wealthy people. I've spoken about this, I think, before in other podcasts, but there was a status of landowners, and therefore they were actually considered to be important because of their wealth. Who passed between the par- the parts of the of the cough. I will place them in the hands of their enemies, and those who seek their, their souls. And their bodies will be to the to their to the feeding to the birds the prey of the heavens, I add the word prey, and the animals or the beasts of the field. Now this is very, very similar to some of the documents that I've seen um, from the ancient Near East. So this is strongly, strongly, strongly embedded inside that, that culture. It says, Vetzidkiyahu Melech Yudan, Zedekiah king of Judah, Vetzaravetem Beyadoi Vehem, and his ministers I will place in, in the hands of their enemies, Veyad Mevakshen of Sham, in the hands of those who seek their souls. A repeat of the previous language. Veyad Chel Melech Bavel, in the hand of the, the army of the king of Babylon, Haolim Alechem, who, who have removed themselves from upon you. Because basically what happened is that Babylonians retreated because the Babylonians didn't stay all the time in the same place. What's very interesting is that the, the, the siege of Tyre went on for a very, very, very long time. But usually what they do is they went to war and then they would have attracted towards winter, so they went back home during the winter. So here they did an agreement with the Babylonians as well, probably, and this is where Babylonians moved off. It says, And I command the word of the Lord, and I will bring them back to the city. And they will battle upon it. And they will capture it and burn it with fire. And the cities of Judah are a place desolate from no dwellers. So this ends with a very, 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 it ends with a very, very negative tone. And again, as I said, I apologize for the noise. Usually it's very, very quiet at this time of night. But for some reason today, there's a lot of noise. But we'll carry on. We're almost done here. So now we actually skip. We actually skip back into the previous chapter, chapter 33, to end with something, usually to end with something positive. So we're dealing with 33, 25, 26. It says, and he ends with this principle, because we have in the beginning of Jeremiah, he talks negative, but then he brings in the whole idea of the covenant still stands. says, Adonai, that says the Lord, Im lo omam if not for my covenant of day or night, the, the laws of the heavens and the earth I would not place. Now, what does he mean here, my covenant day and night? So I would say maybe he means here my covenant, my continuous covenant. Yeah, so what he's actually saying here, I place laws of day and night, the laws of the heavens and the earth, if I have not placed them, Gam Zera Yaakov and David of the also the seed of Jacob and David my servant em as mikachat mizaro moshelim I will I will spurn from taking from his seed as as rulers el Zera Avraham Yitzchak ve Yaakov to the seed of Avraham Yitzchak is actually written with a sin here not a tzadi that's a variation that we have of Abraham Isaac and Jacob ki ashivet shevutam verachamtim for I will return their captivity and I will show them mercy. So he actually ends here with something positive. He says, you'll be sent out in exile. But he said, but don't forget, I can bring you back. Jeremiah has a very, very bad name sometimes of being a, a, a prophet of doom. But in truth, Jeremiah actually tries to also send, in many cases, a very, very positive note of there's hope and you'll get there. But he lived in a time of turmoil. He actually, he is the prophet who lived inside the destruction itself. And out of that destruction, he also sees hope. 
And that's part of the message that we get from Jeremiah all the time. In any case, again, as I said, I apologize for the background noise. No control over that, unfortunately. I literally had to stop the recording in the middle um, to, to, to deal with the noise that came from uh, some yelling and screaming from the outside, which is still continuing a little bit. Uh, but unfortunately, my neighbors are having some kind of a fight, and I have no control over this. And because of my schedule, it's very difficult for me to schedule recordings. So I apologize for the noise, and hopefully maybe in the in the editing, we'll be able to at least get some of the noise out. But in any case, I hope you enjoyed the content, not the background. And as I've said, like I always say, share, feel free to share. I get sometimes these interesting messages of, can we share? The answer is yes, most definitely share, comment, and hopefully next time we'll have more quiet in the background. Koltuf.